Pastor Phil, and I just want to welcome you to our church. We are glad you're here. We understand church to be about connecting with God and with other people. And we exist because of what Jesus has done for us by dying on the cross and rising again. And because of what uh, Jesus has done, we can have peace with him and we can have eternal hope. And so we believe uh, this is our mission that we're called to, and that's to walk with Jesus personally, locally and globally. And uh, we believe church is one way to help that happen. Church as in the people, not the building. Church is the people. Um, so just want to welcome you. I uh, hope that we can meet in person, um, but we're glad you're here.
Good morning. Welcome to our service this morning. In our Sunday school class, we have been slowly working our way through the book of Matthew. I'm sure you've probably heard me say that many weeks. But uh, we're almost halfway through. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to be broken up by the Chosen series, but I thought it may be tied in at least. But we've gotten to uh, kind of the part in the book of Matthew where Jesus begins to have a few more run-ins with the Pharisees. And something that he really has an issue with them a lot is they are concerned about all of these rules and laws. And the Pharisees, I think, would have had two kind of, I guess, separate laws. They would have had the Old Testament laws that were written down in the Bible, but then they also had these traditions of the elders, which were the oral traditions that were passed down. And they stemmed from a bit of these Pharisees. I guess they're, they, th- they were still under the belief that God was the God of the Jews, and the entire Jewish nation needed to act a certain way to receive God's blessings. So in order to see that through, their idea was to make a bunch of rules that essentially forced people, by obeying those rules, to not break the commandments. And Jesus' main pushback on them was kind of saying that you are missing the point with all of your rules and traditions. And I think he wouldn't necessarily say the traditions are bad, and I think that's something that I can fall into a bit too, in that we have all these traditions, and they're not bad, but I think it can be sometimes, we can fall into a a cycle where we just do things because it's how they've always been done. We're just kind of worried about, or like we think we have to do these things just because it's the way that we've done them or um, it's what we've been told to do. And we kind of lose sight on why we're doing them and the reasoning behind like the rules and the reasons behind having a relationship with Jesus. And I guess that's something I've been thinking about recently and trying to like keep my mindset on I guess focusing on understanding why I do the things that I do and why I have the certain beliefs that I have. And I guess that's one thing I would maybe just, I guess, remind you of this morning, just to remember why we do these things and that God wants to have a relationship with us. It's not about following these laws, and it's about using our actions to have a relationship with him. Will the ushers please come forward for this morning's offering? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this morning and for everyone that can be here today, God. I want to thank you for um, sending your son, Jesus, to come down the cross for us, God. And I pray that um, through our actions that we can just form a relationship with you, one like uh, a parent to a child, God, and that we can just um, form that connection with you, God, and that we can just um, keep that in mind, God, and that we can gain hope and confidence from that and receive the gift of salvation, God. And I pray that we can just use that hope to um, shine out to others, God, and to reach out to all those in our lives that might not um, know you as well. And I God, I pray that we can just be a light to them and just um, help brighten their day. I pray that you would bless this offering and all the hands that gave it. In name we pray. Amen. Good morning. I invite you to turn to number 15 in the, oh, I forget what it's called, the Midnight Hymnal, number 15. As you can see up here, uh, what Pastor Travis is preaching on this morning, and one of the things was that the devil tried to get Jesus, tried to coerce Jesus into worshiping him. And so I thought it would help us to remind ourselves who we are really worshiping. 
So our call to worship this morning will be number 15. I'd like to uh, stand with me and just sing this. I worship the King, all glorious above.
Good morning. Welcome to our service here this morning. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this beautiful day that you have blessed us with. We thank you for the many blessings you have given to us. We thank you that even though our circumstances are not always what we um, would desire them to be, sometimes they may be difficult, hard, um, whatever, you name it, we thank you that you are faithful, that you will never leave us or forsake us, and that we can always count on you to be there, to um, be a comforter, a helper in those times of need, Lord. Just be with us this morning. As we look into your word, guide and direct us, uh, open our our hearts, our minds to hear from you this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. There is a children's church this morning, uh, so those of you uh, that participate in that, uh, you're welcome to go down at this time. So my message this morning was titled, um, Who is the Devil? Sun Tzu, I think is how you pronounce it, was a Chinese general um, from in B.C. sometime. There's a quote from him that says, If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. And if you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will will succumb in every battle. So as Christians, we don't want to become obsessed or focused so much on the enemy, but I think it's important to know who our enemy is, uh, what we're up against, what his schemes are, to be able to create a defense against that. But just like in sports, you have interactive sports um, where you're playing against an opponent or another team um, directly, you need to have an offense and a defense. Most teams prepare defensively for the schemes that the other team is gonna run against them, but they also need to be able to execute their offense without, you have some teams with some sports where you can win a game defensively without the offense doing anything, but that's few and far between. You need an offense. Uh, So we don't want to become focused. That's why you're not going to hear many messages here on our enemy. We're mostly going to hear messages on our offense, on Christ Jesus and, and what he can do through and for us. But first I want to point out um, I think, there we go, all right, 1 Peter 5.8 does say that he is your adversary, so he is, and what does, what does adversary mean? Adversary is an opponent, someone who's against you, so Satan is our adversary, We are at battle. He is at battle with us. The question is whether we recognize that we are at battle as well, whether we are at war, and whether we're going to acknowledge that and prepare for battle. So who is the devil? I want to start by taking a look at his origin. And for that, I want to turn to Ezekiel 28. So if you want to turn to Ezekiel 28, this is... uh, passage of scripture that is, I think Ezekiel's uh, told to give a warning to the king of Tyre, and many people believe that that this section of scripture is actually talking about the power behind the king, the power that is, is influencing and controlling the king of Tyre, as opposed to him himself, and we'll look into uh, why that is. So, but to start, uh, Ezekiel 28, uh, verse 12, I want to read from verse 12 to verse 19. Ezekiel, 12, Ezekiel 28, 12 to 19. 
Son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord says. You were, you were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you, ruby, topaz, and emerald, chrysolite, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created, till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence, and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God, and I expelled you, O guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. By, by your many sins and dishonest trade, you have desecrated your sanctuaries. So I made a fire come out from you, and it consumed you. I reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who were watching. All the nations who knew you are appalled at you. You have become to a you have come to a terrible, a horrible end, and will be no more. So I want to break this down and go through it verse by verse. First off, uh, it says that you were in Eden. So now we know from Scripture, we're kind of limited as to who was in Eden. So we know the king of Tyre was not in Eden, so this is not referring to him. We know who was in Eden. We got Adam, Eve, and the devil. Secondly, actually, I forgot. I'm going to jump, jump on this one real quick because I realized I left it off my list. But he, it mentions that he was full of wisdom in verse 12. You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom. He's, he's crafty. He's wise. He knows scripture. He knows our tendencies, our hearts. He's going to use all of that against us. Number two, beauty, it says. You were perfect in beauty. And then it goes on to list in verse 13 all these different uh, stones that he was adorned with. Precious stones. He's, he was a perfection, or uh, yes, the perfection of beauty. Number three. So here's uh, the version I read doesn't say this, the NIV. If you go back and look at King James, and I struggle a little bit with this interpretation uh, from King James to NIV, also at the in the last half of this section that we read, which I'll explain in a little bit. But verse 13 in NIV here, it says, your settings and mountings were made of gold. King James Version, I think, says, if somebody has it, you can correct me, tamarits and pipes. Is that correct? Which would be tambourines and pipes would probably be like horns or something along that line. So because many people believe that he may have been in charge of music. We don't know, but what we do know is God's angels praise him constantly. We read about that in Revelation, how they were singing day and night uh, to God. So he would have been a part of that as well. Number four, he was a created being. So God, everything God made, or everything, God is the only thing that is not created. Everything else was created. He was a created being as well, along with all the other angels, all the other beings that God created, humans. Number five, he was a cherub. And I find this really interesting if we look at this. It says, you were anointed as a guardian cherub. 
These would be, if you've ever seen pictures of the Ark of the Covenant that the Israelites had that was supposed to house God's spirit that they carried around with them, and it had these uh, winged creatures on it. Their wings were usually kind of uh, spread front like that, protecting the ark. Um, those were cherubs. And so it mentions here that you were a guardian cherub. And at the beginning of verse 13, it said you were in Eden, which makes me wonder, was Satan originally was, because uh, it says you were appointed. Was he put in Eden to guard Eden, I don't know. And was that why he was there? Number six. He was blameless. Verse 15 says, you were blameless in all your ways from the day you were created, but then that changed to wickedness when wickedness was found in him from his rebellion and what he did. Number seven, trade. Um, this would be, many people believe that this, the trade that he did was from uh, basically convincing some of the angels to go along with him in his rebellion. Um, verse, in, in Romans, I'll just read this real quick. You don't have to turn there. But Romans 12, 4 says, His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. Many people believe that this is representative of him taking a third of the angels in this trade, in this negotiation that he did, and um, taking them along with him in his fall. You know the phrase, misery loves company. Um, and... And Jesus, Phil just mentioned this a few weeks ago. This is sort of like he's creating an insurrection here. Jesus was accused of doing this um, when, when he had, when he had his disciple, when he told his disciples to buy swords, and then I forget how it's worded, but it's mentioned about that Jesus was leading an insurrection. That's a popular word today. Um, I find that interesting. All right, number eight, he was driven out, it tells us in verse 16, through your, widespread, through your widespread trade you were filled with violence and you sinned, so I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God, I expelled you, O guardian cherub. Isaiah, if you guys want to turn back, it's just a couple books before this, in Isaiah 14, Isaiah 14, 12, and if you want to keep your finger in here then, because we're going to come back to this again. So Isaiah 14, verse 12, how you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn, you have been cast down to the earth, you were once, you who once laid low the nations. So he was cast from heaven. And if you, if you notice here, he's referred to as the morning star, and we have uh, some other scriptures where Jesus is referred to as the morning star. But uh, there's two interpretations here. One is, I think in King James Version, it says, this says, O morning star, son of the dawn. I think King James Version says, son of the morning star, or something along that. But Jesus is referred to as the bright morning star. Um, and angels are beings of light. And so Jesus would be the bright star, the bright light, where these would just be stars. So it's just kind of a descriptive word given here. And Revelation 12, again, uh, verses 7 and 8, talks about this battle that goes on. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called, called the devil 
or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. So these angels would have then become demons and they were all cast out of heaven. And lastly, verse 9, so what caused Satan to rebel against God? Pride and equality with God. So we read in verse 18 and 19 of, while you guys guys are there in Isaiah, let's read that one first. Verses 13 and 14. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars, above the angels of God, and I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. I want to be like God. This, is, this should be, sound familiar to us. We've heard this before. Satan's tactics he used in the Garden of Eden, if you eat the fruit, you will be like God, knowing good from evil. And in Ezekiel, um, in verses 18 and 19, it says, By your many sins and dishonest trade, you have desecrated your sanctuaries, so I made a fire come out from you, and it consumed you. I reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who are watching. I think that I have the wrong, it's supposed to be verse 17. In your heart, you became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So his beauty, his splendor, he... He was beautiful, he was full of wisdom, he was, had music. These are still all things that he uses today to pervert things that were meant for God, and he perverts them and uses them to try to lead people astray. And so this here as well is another, these last few verses, I think it's verse 18 to 19, where it talks about how he was... Uh, cast out and reduced to ashes, and all the nations who knew him are appalled at you, it says. I think this is a poor translation into the NIV as well. King James Version, all these are saying, I did this. You know, I did this to you. This was done to you. King James Version says, I will do this. This will be done to you. These are things yet to come, because if, as we know, not all the nations are appalled at Satan. He actually has control, sway, power over nations, which we'll look at in a little bit. So, let's turn to Matthew chapter 4, and we'll go through that. This is the main text I had up. Um, I actually want to start uh, in Matthew 4, verse 3. This is a very familiar passage about Jesus being tempted in the desert. He fasted for 40 days, and and then Satan comes to him and tempts him. Starting in verse 3, the temptation came to him, sorry, the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city And had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and his angels came and attended him. So I want to look at a couple different ways through these verses on ways that he tempts us. 
So number one, Jesus was hungry. He was fasting in the desert for 40 days. He, had a phys- he, was, he was a human just like us. He had those same needs and desires that we have. Hebrews 4, um, 14 to 16, I think, talks about him being tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. So he had these physical needs. He was hungry. So Jesus, tempts his, Jesus comes at him to appeal to his physical need for food. So he, and he does the same thing to us. We have a spiritual need that we need to be filled with spiritual food that we need more than physical food. Jesus says this, man does not live by bread alone, but from every word that comes from the mouth of God. But Satan is going to take us and say, you have these physical needs that you need to take care of. Uh, and not that they're bad things, we do need to take care of our bodies because they are the temples for the Holy Spirit, but Satan's going to try to make us put our physical needs above our spiritual needs and say, this takes higher priority. Um, you know, I couldn't make it to church today because I was tired and I needed to sleep in. I have a big day tomorrow, you know, whatever, you name it. We can find excuses for why we put these things, our physical needs, above our spiritual needs. Number two, our self-worth. And this kind of goes along with it as well, but he tells uh, Jesus here to throw himself off this cliff. He says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself off because it says his angels will protect you. And so basically what he's doing here is he's saying, you know, are you really that valuable to God? You know, we've seen this, you've probably seen this in some relationships, maybe you've done this, where you say, you know, if you really loved me, you would do this for me. He's trying to get Jesus to say, if God really loves you, if you really are the Son of God, you can do this, and he'll protect you, right? So he's, he challenges us, again, to look at ourselves, take our focus off of God, and put our focus on ourselves and question our self-worth in God. Does God really love you? Is he really going to protect you? He questions what God says about us. And again, he did this in the garden to Adam and Eve. Did God really say? But Jesus says, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. If you're in a relationship with someone and a husband and wife, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, and you love each other, you're not going to constantly be testing them and say, oh, you know, if you loved me, you would get this for me. If you loved me, you would do this for me. You know, whatever it is. You don't need to be constantly testing each other to see if you really love each other or not. If you do, that's probably a relationship you shouldn't be in. Unless you're married, then you need to work it out. (laughs) Somehow, get help. You're not going to go home and say, Travis told me I need to get a divorce. (laughs) And number three, he twists Scripture. He comes at him and he says, he quotes Scripture here, he will command his angels concerning you. He's He's taking it out of context. We see this all the time um, with different people, churches, you know, whatever, you name it. Sometimes it's done intentionally, sometimes it's done unintentionally. But we, we read about this back in Ezekiel. Satan was full of knowledge, and we see it here. He knows Scripture. He's not ignorant to it. This is why we need to be like the Bereans, who it says when Paul preached to them, they went home and they... And they looked into the scripture to make sure what Paul was saying lined up. Don't just take people at their word. Say, well, this person said this and says this is what this scripture means. So that's what I'm going to go off of. Look into it for yourself and find out if what they're telling you is true. I'm going to read Acts 13.10. says... 
13.10, you are a child of the devil and the enemy of everything that is right. You're full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? So he takes the ways of the Lord and he perverts them. He twists them, takes them out of context to say what he wants them to say. And we see people doing this to lead other people astray. Oftentimes it's intentional, but sometimes it's done unintentional as well. Just from us uh, trying to protect ourselves from these first two ways of Satan putting the focus back on ourselves, then we use scripture to try to protect ourselves from reality of what people maybe are pointing out to us in our lives. And also 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen says, and no wonder, so this is talking about um, men who are false apostles. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is no surprise then that his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. So Satan's going to use scripture. He's going to use people who present themselves as angels of light, as, as disciples, as Christians, as followers of God, to come and as you know, wolves in sheep's clothing to lead people astray. I like this analogy. If you think about a box of crayons, or just colors in general, what color would you say God is? Anybody, go ahead. White. What color would Satan be? Black? Red? Maybe? I would say Satan would be off-white. He presents himself as close to God. He takes things of God, and he just twists them a little bit. He's not the opposite. He's a being created by God. He's full of wisdom. Full, maybe not anymore, but he was full of wisdom, beauty. You know, we went through this. God created him to be that, but he took it, and he, takes, he still does that today. He takes things that God created for good, he just changes it a little bit so that sometimes we think, oh, this, you know, this, this looks right, this looks okay, but it's not. It's just, it's just a little bit off, a little bit off-white. Because many of us, if we see something white and we see something black, we're going to know this is where we need to be and this is completely way off base. But if we have white and off-white, we're going to say, oh, yeah, I can, okay, this, this is okay. I can get into this. And it leads us down that path towards full rebellion to God. People who study counterfeit money I'm told, and I think Phil might have mentioned this not too long ago in one of his messages as well. They study the real thing. They don't spend time studying counterfeit money, I think because the way they make counterfeit money changes constantly. Um, but they study the real thing. And why do they do that? You focus on the real thing so that when something fake comes, you just you realize something's, this just doesn't feel right. This just doesn't look right. Something's off about it. I can't quite put my finger on what it is, but something's not right here. And so that's why we don't become obsessed and focus on our enemy, but we focus on our offense. We focus on God and Christ and study him and knowing him so that when something off-white comes in, we're like, wait a second, this, something just doesn't seem right here. And we recognize that. And we come to Scripture and we say, well, okay, does this line up? with what I'm being told, with what I'm hearing. And 
And lastly, number four, he offers false fulfillment. He offered Jesus. Again, the devil took him to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. He offers him money, power, respect. They're the things that people, everybody wants today yet. Luke 4 also gives an account of this encounter of Jesus being tempted in the desert. And this temptation, the way it's worded in here, there's a little bit added in that is not in Matthew that I want to point out because I find this really interesting as well. I mentioned that we were going to look at this. And as Luke 4, verse 6 where it mentions this. The devil led him, starting in verse 5, the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me. Satan has the ability to control, to manipulate nations, governments, powers and authority. All this has been given to him. We see this in Job when he was going, he comes to heaven before God and God says, you know, where have you been? He said, I was going back and forth through the earth and, and then he has the ability to go and attack Job and his family. But He cannot control us. He has control over nations, governments, uh, but he does not have control. He cannot control us individually as individuals if we have given ourselves to Christ. He has no power over whose we are. Jude 9, uh, Jude, the only book in Jude, verse 9, says, but even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, against Satan, but said, the Lord rebuke you. So we need to remember whose we are. We are Jesus Christ's. We are God's children, and he's the one who has the power over Satan. Satan has no power over him. When we try to go to battle against Satan by ourselves, by our own power, we're going to fail. The archangel Michael even realized that and respected that and just said, the Lord rebuke you. We need to remember that Christ is the one with the power to defeat Satan. And he made promises here, uh, money, power, respect. He offered that to Christ, I think, with no full intention of keeping those promises. He's not going to give anyone the power over him. And this brings up another question, too. So some people, uh, maybe you've never done this, but what if, what if another angel decides that they want to rebel against God? What if that would happen again? Okay, so... First off, we have in, in America, we have a two-party system. We have Democrats, we have Republicans. Every once in a while, we have someone who runs as a third party, and it's pretty much a joke, right? Because they have to be, basically all they do is they take votes away from one party or the other. If you'd have another angel, he's first going to have to beat out Satan, right? Because Satan's not going to allow him to have the power over him because that's what he's seeking, John 8, 40, John 8, 44 says he was a liar and a father of lies. He was a liar from the beginning. First Peter uh, 5, 8, where it says he is your adversary. He talks about, and he says he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for whom he may devour. 
a few months ago in our bulletin had a picture on the front of a lion and it said running from the lion and I don't know if you guys know this or not but on the back there's usually a little uh, kind of devotional relating to the picture on the front sometimes they're very interesting uh, there was one one time about uh, a family that was in another country where they didn't know the language language real well and I think a sister had got stung by a bee and they were going to try to get help, ointment or something to put on it and and the brother didn't know the word for bee and he went and told them that his sister was bitten by a, a monster. Um, so yeah, sometimes they're a little interesting but this one about the lion said, one image that lingers in my mind from a five-day African safari is that of a lion stalking an elk-like wapiti. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. The wapiti stood on the crest of a hill, virtually motionless, but obviously aware of its mortal enemy. Several hundred yards away, at the base of the hill, the lion, strong and beautiful, but dangerous, paced back and forth, all the while keeping the wapiti in plain view. Then suddenly the fleet-footed elk turned and sprinted away. It would live to see another day. And like the wapiti, we as Christians constantly must be aware of the presence of Satan in the world. His primary desire is to wreak havoc in the church and in our personal lives. When we are drawn to unsafe circumstances, we can pause, recognize the destructive evil one, and ask God to help us flee. He will always answer this prayer and deliver us. We can find safety and security in the protection of Jesus Christ. I always thought about this scripture, and I kind of viewed it as this, the way this talked about it, as a line, you know, sneaking through the tall grass, kind of hiding, camouflaging himself, sneaking up on his prey to attack it. But that's not what this says here. It says he prowls around like a roaring lion. I don't know if you guys have ever heard a lion roar. I think I have a video here. Do we have? Okay, he's done. So you're not going to sneak up on too many people that way. Uh, we were at Lake Tobias one time, and they had a lion there, and he started roaring. And to me, that was like, I mean, that's fascinating. Those of you who, uh, who hunt are fascinated by elk and the elk bugling. They say a lion's roar can be heard for up to five miles. It's just, I, if you'd be out in the wild and hear that, I think that would just be a, an incredible, amazing sound. But like I said, he's not sneaking up on anybody doing that. And this says he prowls around like a roaring lion. But check this out. Satan has, he said he has this power over the nations of the earth. Why does a Satan walk around roaring? He's letting everybody know, this is my territory. I own this. If you want this, you have to come and challenge me. Satan is basically out there bragging, this is mine, and I'm coming for you, looking for who he can devour. He seeks to distract us, to discourage us, to create discontent in us, 
the desire for something greater, for what we believe is something greater. Genesis 3, that was what the temptation he used with Adam and Eve. Look at this fruit. Don't you want this? Yeah, you have all this other trees, the fruit you can have from all these other trees, but you don't have this one. You got to have this. This is so much better. He wants to divide us as a body of believers, create doubt in ourselves and in God. Did God really say this? Is he really going to protect you? He tries to deceive us using Scripture and to destroy us. John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, typically, when you talk about something that you're going to do to somebody, you save the worst thing for last. Most of us would look at this list, and the worst thing on this list would be for us to be killed, right? I mean, it, if you're going to destroy us, you're going to take this, but you know, we try to preserve our lives, our earthly life. He says, it says he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He doesn't just want to kill us, that's not enough. He wants to destroy our, our, our faith. He wants to destroy our witness. He wants to destroy everything about us that could possibly carry on a legacy of Christ in our lives. If he kills us, many people have died and in their death, have created a legacy that far outweighs what they did in life. So if he kills us as, as a missionary, if a missionary is killed, you know, that creates a great story that's carried on for years. That's not enough for him. He has to just first destroy our legacy in Christ. It's not enough to just kill us. His primary plan is to expose the world to evil. Pandora's box, I don't know, I haven't studied this a whole lot, but apparently Pandora's box, um, I guess there was some brothers, I don't know, she married one, or I don't know what, the, what, what it was, but Zeus gave, I think it was Zeus gave Pandora a box, told her not to open it, but he gave her the key to unlock it as well. So probably he wanted her to open it, I don't know. If you know the story better, am I getting it semi-right? <laughs> um, but anyhow, she opens the box, and all kinds of evil come out of it. And that's how evil was introduced into the world. Satan had Adam and Eve in a perfect world, and all he had to do was get them to eat the fruit that they weren't supposed to, and he could unleash all kinds of evil into the world. He just had to get them exposed to it. He had to expose sin into their lives and get it out there. I think sometimes that's a little bit of the problem with Hollywood. Many people who have inclinations of evil in their lives but don't know how to act out on it Hollywood shows them, here's something you can do. Here's a way you can act out. Here's an evil you can try. We just need to be exposed to it to put it in our thoughts. And that's what this on the screen here is showing. And I did that before. If anybody remembers, with alcohol, I had, you know, being completely sober and no drink at all be, to being completely drunk and said, where do you draw that line? Where is it okay so if we have purity on one side and sin on the other, where is the line where we cross over in between? And I think Satan wants us to come up to that line and look out over the edge and see all that sin and destruction over there and say, I'm okay as long as I'm over here, as long as I don't cross this line. If he can get us to see that, what is that? It's temptation. We don't come up to the line and say, I'm glad I'm not doing that. I'm glad that's not me. Okay, that looks kind of fun over there. And tempt ourselves with that. Stay as far away from that line over on the purity side as we can. So 
So I'm not going to leave you guys with that. We don't need to fear. We don't need to focus on our enemy. We have a lot to be thankful for. You guys didn't know I was going to turn this into a Thanksgiving Day message. (laughs) We have a lot to be thankful for. We know who holds the victory, and we know we are his. We have a king, we have a lord, we have a savior who already has the victory. And I mentioned this uh, before, but Hebrews 4, 14 to 16 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And also Romans 16, 20 says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. So as I mentioned before, like those who study to recognize counterfeit money, we should do the same thing. Put our focus and our study on the real thing, on Jesus Christ. So that when something fake comes along, like when fake money comes along and trying to circulate in there, they recognize it and they say, well, this doesn't look right. When, it, when he comes in to our churches, to our families, to our personal lives, we recognize it and say, whoa, hey, This doesn't look right. I don't think I want to let this into my life. I don't want to let this into my family. I don't want to let this into my church. God's church. So I want to close. I have a song I want to play. Uh, This is a song that I really like, that I use sometimes. It gets me fired up. So I think we'll play this. Then, Doug, if you want to come up, Immediately after that, all right. Yeah, that song is hard to follow, <laughs> but I got one. <clears throat> Back from the 16th century, number 325. <clears throat> A mighty fortress is our God. <clears throat> Good compliment to a contemporary song. I want you to stand together with me and sing this. It talks about <clears throat> our powerful enemy, but our powerful God. <clears throat> Excuse me. A mighty fortress is our God.
I was thinking about this. Donna, did you shake your head that I was get, that I got that story wrong? Did Oh. I was thinking may, it was it would make more sense if Hades gave her the box and wanted her to open it, but I don't know. Anyway, uh this is our opportunity for prayer and share, but first, uh we've been offering time for if anyone wants to share their story, speak now or forever hold your peace. All right. Uh, is there anything you would like to uh, share with the congregation? Good morning. This is Todd. Um, so I sent out an email prayer request uh, the second half of the week about a coworker of mine that had to leave an abusive um, relationship, so she left her house and um, all of that. And so at work, we are trying to, you know, kind of get her back on her feet and help her along. She's not really from this area, um, so there's not much of a support system. Um, but I realized I was maybe a little too vague um, in saying where she's going to be living, um, so that if you feel like you want to get gift cards, you know where to get them for. Um, so we don't exactly know where she's going to be living. Um, she has some living quarters lined up for this week um, in the Lidditz area. Um, we work, um, she works with me um, close to Paul B. You know, we both work at Keystone, but most people don't know where that is, but most people know where Paul B is. Um, so. If you're looking for where to get gift cards, is that something you want to do? Um, Sharp Proper would be good. Martin's would be good. Or family-owned markets, I guess, is what they technically are. Um, gas cards for Turkey Hill. Um, Subway is close to us. So any of those would be great. Walmart, Amazon. You know, Amazon will take stuff wherever you put the address in for. Um, so if you're looking for ways that you can help that way, great. Um, also, your prayers would be huge, um, both for her and for those of us trying to help get her kind of established. Um, if you know of any rental properties that are available, um, that would be huge also. Um, her credit is not very good, um, so that makes it quite difficult. Um, and there's also some other circumstances that make it difficult. Uh, if you want more information on that, um, you can come and talk to me. Maybe that's all I'll share um, openly like this. But yeah, if you have any more questions, uh, please feel free to ask. And then another thing, um, yesterday I was at a funeral. Um, so if you remember a couple months ago, I shared about this guy, my friend, whose dad passed away. Um, so. He's about, the guy, my friend's about my age, and within the last six months has buried his mom and his dad. Um, so you can keep him, his name's Corey Harrison, um, you can keep him in your prayers and his family. Um, the mom was only 58, and she wasn't, well, she was sick. Um, it was some heart something um, that kind of just took her right like that, so... Yeah, it's pretty difficult. Can't quite imagine 
being in his shoes, 35 years old, and having to bury both of your parents and keep them in your prayers, thanks. Uh, this is Wilbur. Uh, just asking prayer for uh, Lucille's father. Actually, he's in the hospital uh, because of COVID, and they're concerned because he, he has a weak heart. So keep a prayer for them. I think we can remember Randy, I think it's Friday. It's his surgery. Also wanted to give an update on Leah. Um, so we got results back from, uh, and if you, if you want better details, talk to Carolyn. Uh, but so there was a liver biopsy, a bone marrow biopsy. Um, at this point, they're not concerned about anything. Um, there's this is basically my understanding. There was something that showed up because they looked for it. It wasn't something that just showed up, but because of the issues that she was having with her liver going back and forth, they looked for something and they saw it, so they wanted to go look further. But the amount of that in her body is not significant to be concerned about it. So, and like he said, like the doctor told us, the only reason we found it is because we were looking for it. Um, and, and he basically said, maybe other transplant patients have this same thing, but they don't know it because they don't look for it. There's no study out there really been done on it. And so they would still like to s just keep an eye on it. They want to see us again in like four to six months, he said. So I think they're going to try to schedule us for February. So basically, I asked Carolyn, I was like, so my understanding is that they don't really think it's an issue, but they don't know, so they, they want to use Leah as a guinea pig? And she's like, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, they're, they're going to change some of her meds and stuff. Uh, they think that that could be part of why her liver has been going back and forth. And, um, so yeah, that's where we're at there. Leah did get some flowers, uh, it said from Game of Mennonite Church yesterday from Rock Sands, and I told Leah if she didn't have Children's Church today, she could um, thank you guys for that, and she said, well, maybe I could write a note for you to read, so she wrote a note, and I want to point out that the flowers came in a teacup, like the uh, saucer in the cup, which is pretty cool. And Leah said, thank you for the flowers and the teacup. I can't wait to get to use the teacup. My favorite flowers out of all them are the pink roses. It really made me happy and full of joy. Thank you. All right, now I get to try to pray. <laughs> Would you guys stand? Oh, and then when we're done praying, uh, we're going to watch a Thanksgiving Day video done by the skit guys. If you know who the skit guys are, it's not funny. Uh, they usually do funny things, but this one I didn't think was really funny. It was more serious. Uh, but after that video, you guys are dismissed. So would you stand for prayer and benediction? Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for who you are. Thank you for your son, Jesus, and all that he's done for us, sacrificing himself. Thank you that we can know that he holds the keys to victory and that we can be a part of that through him just by simply accepting him into our lives and acknowledging him as Lord of all and Lord of our lives, Lord God, confessing our sins and confessing him as Lord and Savior. Thank you for that. Thank you for this body of believers. I pray that you'd be with us as we go from here to be a light to the world, to impact those around us. And thank you for opportunities to be able to do that. And we just pray that you continue to 
present us with those opportunities. I just pray for your hand of blessing over everyone as we go from here, everyone here and everyone watching online as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, God, for trusting me to be his dad. Thank you, Lord, that when a door closes, you're still going to take care of me. And thank you for cheetahs and pickles and famines and mommies and daddy. Thank you, Father, <laughs> for always giving me perspective. I'm so sorry. Thank you, God, that you are the great physician of both my body and my soul. Father, thank you for knowing my family's needs even before I do. And for ladybugs and old people and Disney movies and Miss Walker and donuts. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me that I'm never alone. Thank you, God, for what I have. And also, I wouldn't mind an upgrade soon. Thank you, Father God, for love, joy, peace, and patience. Lord, especially patience. And thank you for Jesse, even though he's mean during recess. Help him find a good friend. That's what he needs. I love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God, for childlike faith. <laughs>